Hey guys, this is Stowe Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and I want to let you guys know that we are doing our year-end fundraising drive. If you donate this week, your donation will actually be doubled thanks to the generous support of Dr. Gary Schlarbaum, who has been a longtime benefactor of the Mises Institute. Donate $25 or more, even better, you will get a copy of Tom DeLorenzo's newest booklet, The Axis of Evil, America's Three Worst Presidents. Some honest history for this holiday season. Again, this fundraising drive is going through the end of the year, and every donation is greatly appreciated. It allows us to do great work like our podcast that you are enjoying. You can donate today by visiting Mises.org slash Radio Rothbard 24. That's M-I-S-E-S dot org slash Radio Rothbard 24. Like the show you're listening to with the year at the end. We look forward to more content like this going into 2025. Thank you for listening. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin with the Mises Institute. And with me today is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And also with us is one of our economists, Jonathan Newman. Jonathan's with, been with us many times before. Uh, also featured in our new documentary on the Federal Reserve called Playing With Fire. He's got lots of great insights in that. If you haven't seen that yet, go over to our YouTube channel and check that out. That's at uh, YouTube, the Mises Media channel. Or you can watch that uh, on our website at Mises.org slash fire. And uh, check it out. And I just want to talk a little bit about some of those related issues with, with Jonathan today. Really, I want to talk about what, uh, how Trump has basically been handed a turd of an economy. I mean, I don't know that there's any other way to, to say that. That uh, is just... the technical economics term. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I think that really just communicates what, what the story is here. Now, I know there's lots of, uh, lots of people who still believe in all the, the Biden... Uh, myths that have been put out in the past uh, couple of years about how it's just the most amazing economy of all time. And uh, they count uh, every job that uh, came back into existence after the, the government enforced lockdowns destroyed millions of jobs. And oh, look, look at how much employment has been created since 2020. Of course, that's all just a function of uh, massive intervention on the part of the regime. So the reality is that what we're seeing is manufacturing indexes very weak. What we're seeing is uh, total full-time private sector job growth extremely weak. In fact, this, in the last report, we saw private sector jobs actually decline. Uh, and then uh, basically all three often used measures of price inflation were all up in the most recent data. We're looking at the core price inflation stuff. We're looking at just the regular CPI, all inched upward after the Fed decided that uh, it wasn't uh, going to let interest rates uh, stay put anymore and instead kept talking about forcing them down, had a mega cut back in September, and lo and behold, prices inched back up. And what this means is affordability problems for regular people. We continue to see more and more data showing that uh, in the past five years, the United States has experienced immense amounts of wealth creation uh, for the, the upper classes, people who benefit from massive Fed-induced inflation, people who already own huge amounts of assets. They're doing very well. Why? Because money creation leads to asset price inflation. Now, this has been covered uh, many times by one of our great economists, Brendan Brown. And he's talked about how you can't just look at CPI inflation. That's one of the last places that you see uh, uh, evidence of monetary inflation show up. You see it much earlier and much more universally in asset price inflation. We see it in stock prices, clear correlation between stock prices and monetary growth. That's a lot of work has been done by that uh, on that by Thorsten Polite on our website. And also, as Brendan Brown has pointed out, asset price inflation. We see that a lot in home prices heading upward. And uh, that's something we can talk about a little bit today, how in spite of uh, the Fed's uh, attempt to force down interest rates again in September, we haven't seen that play out in uh, terms of longer-term debt 
and certainly not in 30-year fixed mortgages. And yet at the same time, prices have continued to uh, go up in home prices or at least have remained stable with uh, only, only here and there have we seen any significant evidence of price cuts in uh, single family homes and really just in for purchase homes in general. And what I see here recently in some data from the National Association of Realtors is that first time buyers as a share of U.S. housing purchases is really now at a 40 year low. It's, it's lower now even than where it was back in that initial surge of, of interest rates that occurred after the early uh, 1980s. And if you, if you talk to some of the old timers, now in this case, I'm using that term affectionately. So you talk, talk, if you talk to some of the people who remember selling homes or buying homes in the first half of the 1980s, man, they remember, right, the 12% or higher mortgage rates that many people were getting. Uh, the difference, of course, at the time was that prices reduced significantly to reflect that. Uh, that's not going on right now. What you're seeing is rising interest rates not reflected by any significant cuts, at least not so far, in prices. And so now you're, you're getting down below 25% of first-time buyers as a share of U.S. housing purchases. So what this means is that as people who own a lot of assets uh, continue to get richer, thanks to monetary creation, so billionaires... Uh, have gotten massively richer over the last five years. Upper middle class people who are earning 200, 300,000 and uh, already own two houses, they're doing great. They've already got big stock portfolios, doing fantastically. Uh, however, if you're just some regular person who's trying to save up for a home, good luck. Good luck with that, unless, of course, your parents can help you a lot. And so we continue to see a decline in real. Uh, in real wages for people who aren't already doing quite well, people who don't already own assets. So thanks to the central bank, we've created an economy where people who own assets will continue to buy more assets, continue to see their wealth increase significantly. People who don't already own assets, they're largely getting locked out of buying new assets. Unless, of course, you want to buy like one share of Berkshire Hathaway B stock or something. You might be able to put together few hundred bucks for that, but that's not going to uh, help you nearly as much as a home purchase in terms of your lifestyle and your future wealth accumulation. So uh, this is the economy that Trump is coming into. And we continue to see also just problems ahead, which is shown in, I think, the bond markets by the fact that longer term interest rates haven't been going down in spite of attempts by the Fed to get interest rates back down. And this is most likely reflects fears about ongoing uh, spending in, uh, in deficit spending, which is a significant problem uh, because that, is, that causes yields to go up because the, the federal government continues to flood the economy with more and more debt. And so we look everywhere and where's the good news? And I, it seems that mostly what I'm hearing from the dogmatic Trump supporters is that well, everything will be fine because Trump is Trump. That, uh, that Trump loves America and that he's going to fix it somehow. I mean, this is how simpletons think, of course, is that if you have a positive attitude that everything will be fixed, uh, what matters is your emotional state, what matters is how you feel about things. Uh, and I know that a lot of conservatives like to pretend that they're guided strictly by logic and facts, which is, of course, complete nonsense. Uh, <laughs> they, 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 sorry, you're not. And uh, you could see this back in, in uh, during the Bush administration. People basically uh, said that if you don't agree with them, then you're you're in favor of terrorism and you hate America. I mean, that was a standard stock re response among conservatives. Uh, yes, no, no emotion there at all. And so this has, of course, always been a lie that they try to say because what all these hopes that they're pinning on the Trump administration, it's all just pure fantasy and fluff based on. Uh, Trump will fix it somehow. Well, you, you don't just fix things uh, unless you make major changes. Major changes come from major cuts in spending. They come from uh, massive cuts in regulation, which, to its credit, the Trump administration has. It's one of the few places where they've actually done some of the things they said they were going to do was in cutting regulation. Almost nowhere else has they ever done any of the things that they say they're going to do, like cutting federal spending. Uh, reigning in the central bank. The, none of that happened in the first term, and I don't expect any of it to happen in 
the second term. So I just want to look at some of these things that are going on and get Jonathan's perspective because he has a more sophisticated view as a, uh, as a real economist, a real academic economist. Uh, whereas, you know, my, my role as an economist when I was at the, at the state of Colorado is really more as a number cruncher and doing some more basic analysis. But I like to go to Jonathan for some of the, the more sophisticated stuff on interest rates and where the economy is headed. So, Jonathan, what, what would you say is your overall opinion of the state of the economy, right? What are some of the, when you look out there, what are some of the red flags you see that you think need to be addressed if this economy is not going to continue stagnating and possibly even slipping into recession in 2025? Uh, one thing that, uh, uh, people were talking about earlier in the year, but uh, it's uh, I haven't seen as many headlines lately. Is the commercial real estate problem? Uh, now that was a, that was a huge red flag, and people aren't really talking about it uh, as much now. But I think the problem is still there. There's um, a, a ton of empty office space, commercial real estate that's just sitting empty, not being used. Uh, and if it is being used, then the the Businesses that occupy those spaces aren't earning enough revenue to to pay their rents, um, and so there, we've seen like massive discounts, massive uh, decreases in, in the prices. Uh, I mean, there's some like huge headlines where like uh, you know multi million dollar um, real estate was sold for like pennies on the dollar or something like that. So like there's some really crazy stories out there, uh, but th we haven't seen a crash in that you know sector. Um, so that's that's one red flag. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you were just talking about. There's, uh, it, it's very difficult for uh, young families, especially, to to buy their first home because prices are so high, and also mortgage rates are are high as well uh, compared to where they were before. Um, and so that that makes it really difficult for uh, for families to get established. Um, and makes it uh, difficult for them to save. Makes it. Uh, all of the price inflation as well makes it uh, difficult for them to save. Um, and so, uh, I mean, those are just, you know, a couple things. So, like, the price inflation is really bad, especially for, for young families who don't own a lot of assets, like you mentioned. Um, and I do think that there's a lot of issues in, in commercial real estate. Now, uh, one thing, uh, you were talking about movements of uh, interest rates. I do think that inflation expectations are a part of that. So, we, we've seen interest rates uh, increasing bond yields increasing, even though the Fed is uh, trying to push down interest rates. Uh, but you also see that in the mortgage rates, as I mentioned. And I think uh, while inflation expectations are a part of that, we, another part of that could be a default risk. It could be that uh, lenders are worried about the uh, increasing astronomical indebtedness of the United States population, tons and tons of credit card debt. Um, uh, lots of uh, delinquencies and defaults going on. So th there's another red flag for you. It could be that we're uh, due for um, a sort of debt crisis in the in the private sector. Uh, now, a debt crisis for the public sector, that's a different story. We've got other episodes on that. But, I mean, those are the sorts of things that I'm looking at. Well, yeah, uh, mentioning default risk, this applies this uh, back to the our topic of commercial real estate, too, right? Isn't isn't there growing, when we look at what's going on with commercial real estate and the decline in sales prices and the, the ability, I think, to maybe pay off mortgages from sales as interest rates go up and, and as uh, revenues from renters continues to go down, uh, that's going to be an issue there too, right? And, and is the, how, does, how does commercial real estate, I just want to back up a step. Because as just a listener, right, I'm going to, I want somebody, explain to me like I'm a child, uh, Jonathan, why commercial real estate is potentially a problem for the business cycle, right? How could commercial real estate translate into an event that could be truly problematic for the economy at large? Or isn't it just, isn't that just a problem for commercial real estate? Why, why should I care about commercial real estate as in regards to the larger economy? Well, the reason it, it could spread is because the same lenders in commercial real estate are, are also making, you know, like residential mortgages and, and doing other uh, financial uh, services for the, you know, the, the public. So, 
uh, if, if they take a huge hit in their commercial real estate part of their uh, balance sheet, so like if the stuff that they're owning is decreasing in value, if the people that they're renting to aren't paying back, uh, then that means that they have to take those those huge losses, and those huge losses could translate into you know credit completely drying up for, for other things as well. So if uh, my balance sheet is deteriorating because of that thing, then that means I've got to, uh, you know, pick up the slack in other parts of my balance sheet, including uh, lending for mortgages, uh, credit cards, uh, auto loans, everything under the sun. And then that's where they're, who owns uh, commercial real estate is also important because it's not as if, you know, every bank has, you know, a similar style sort of balance sheet. And so you've got X amount of commercial bank exposure, you've got X amount of mortgage rates, and this is kind of pretty uniform across, you know, larger, larger bundles for larger banks, whatever. But regional banks in particular have the largest percentage mm -hmm. of, you know, their investment portfolio within commercial real estate itself. And so that's where some of these broader sort of, uh, of structural problems that have been created um, you know, particularly in the post-2008 world, right, you know, various aspects of the regulatory structure, um, you know, the, the Dodd-Frank sort of style requirements, that, that pushed regional banks to be one of the heaviest lenders in the commercial real estate market itself. And so if you think about it, if, if those are the banks that are the most vulnerable with that kind of particularly toxic form of debt out there, then, you know, that can help skid the ways for, for even further consolidation within the banking sector, which has even broader ramifications when you consider the relationship between banks and the state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why like, you know, the, that commercial real estate time bomb is kind of, it's, it's not only that it's bad for, you know, it can create a bank crisis, but it's protect, the particular type of bank crisis could even have a different sort of fallout um, you know, in term, come, when it, that has an impact on kind of the day-to-day -day average American. Yeah, one of the most amazing graphs you'll ever see is, is just a count it's a time series count of the number of banks over time. So we used to have tons and tons of banks back in the day, uh, but then you just see that number come down and down. And it, you know, the decline becomes steeper with the financial crisis to the point where it looks like we're trending towards like one bank. So <laughs> I wonder what that could mean. <laughs> so it, it, look, it looks like it's exactly what Tho was mentioning is that there's just further consolidation. The big banks gobble up the, the small banks. And the uh, one reason for that is uh, big banks like in uh, uh, 2008, 2009 got this nice big bailout. The smaller banks, not so much. Uh, the smaller banks uh, have to take on these uh, extra risks. Risks. Uh, it's uh, more costly for them to, um, to uh, follow all of the new guidelines and, and all the regulations uh, that uh, many times are actually designed by people from the larger banks. So it's, it's that sort of uh, competitive, you know, using the apparatus of government to harm your uh, competition by designing regulations that your large firm can follow, uh, and it's not so costly, uh, but it's incre incredibly costly for your smaller competitors. And so that's just another way that we've seen tons and tons of bank consolidation uh, means less choices for consumers. Uh, it means more control. It's easier for the federal government, federal reserve to control a smaller number of banks than a large number. Um, yeah, terrible. Uh, trend that we're seeing there. Well, and just to pick it back off of that, and go, go on tangent, I'll bring it back to commercial real estate, though, is that going back to the way Ryan started the show talking about the extent to which, um, you know, this financial environment that we found ourselves in, that it has been good for billionaires, it's been bad for the working class. Um, there's an additional element to that by which we, we, there's been some fascinating um, stuff coming out here lately. It's a problem that we've talked about on Mises.org for quite some time. Um, as well, but it's, I think it's getting more publicity right now with you know, people going on Joe Rogan. Uh, Mark Andreessen had a very good episode on there talking about the extent to which, so we've got this, you know, we have this financialized economy, it, it, it rewards large investors, it penalizes consumers, but then also who are those billionaire, what, what, what part of that billionaire class has benefited the most from it? And this is where kind of the regulatory regime has been kind of beating up, debanking, um, kind of making threats you know, essentially to certain type of interest groups that um, either to force them into compliance with the regime or punish them if they don't fall into compliance. The crypto industry in particular has been, you know, under attack from Gary Gensler and the SEC and uh, that played, I think, you know, there was some political fallback that came to the 2024 election. But so that's what these, these, these combination of these things where it is, you know, we've, we've opened up the spigot, but then where that spigot has been directed, um, again, regional banks have been affected more than big banks because of 2008 re regulation, CFPB, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau created new weapons, that kind of guided sort of stuff. And so it's, it's kind of the worst of both worlds where we've, we have flooded the market. It's, we've benefited the, the top, but then 
those in the top that have been the biggest benefactors have tended to be the, those that are either loyal to the regime or have been coerced into being loyal to the regime. And, and just one, one back on the commercial real estate aspect of it is that, you know, I, I know at times, right, we've been talking about that, we've been raising this red, red flag for a while, and, you know, why is, you know, why is it still continuing to going on and on? Um, I just want to provide one more data point there to, to that conversation, um, which is that uh, at this point, um, from the Fed's own data, uh, delinquency rates on commercial uh, real estate is at its highest point in 10 years. Now, if you look at it on a chart, it doesn't look that big compared to like where it was in 2008. Um, but I did see a Financial Times report, and I love this line, um, that basically the, the step that we're in, in terms of kind of the, 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 the bank's handling of that is a process of extending and pretending. So, uh, so, so that, is, that is what the banking industry is doing with commercial real estate loans while we're still dealing with the kind of the macro consequences of uh, you know, 10 years, or 12 years of, of bad and, and, and four in particular are particularly hostile regulatory environments. Well, I'm glad you mentioned extend and pretend because that, that brings us back to the issue of if your interest rates are going up, it's, it's a lot harder to extend and pretend. Uh, and that's, that's something that I think uh, also affects smaller organizations more than larger for a lot of the reason that uh, Jonathan mentioned. Also, it's just when you're some huge megacorp, it's easier to get loans at a lower interest rate. Uh, but if you're some small local bank, uh, extending and pretending, that is getting another loan at a lower interest rate so you can cover your old debts and avoid bankruptcy, that gets harder and harder. And it's, it's important to remember, if we look at a chart of interest rates over the last 35 years, it's just been a long march downward. So it's been real easy for all of these companies that were never really earning much money, uh, and we call them often zombie companies because really they weren't even doing well based on earnings or revenues. They were doing well because whenever they failed to meet revenue targets or failed to pay their bills, they could just refinance and, uh, and work on solving the problem later. But it seems that if the Fed loses control of interest rates, right? The Fed never has total control of interest rates, right? The Fed is a major player in the markets, but of course, interest rates are determined by huge factors beyond the direct control of the Fed. Uh, and I mean, just as a side note, right? We have detractors out there say that anytime we talk about how the Fed is manipulating interest rates, that, oh, the Mises Institute is wrong because uh, the Fed has virtually no effect on interest rates. To them, I always say, okay, well, then you won't have a problem then if the Fed just simply dumps all of its assets into the market and stops participating in interest rate manipulation altogether, right? We'll just get rid of all open, mark, open market uh, operations of the Fed since the Fed has no effect on interest rates. I have yet to, to get one of those people saying, yes, fine, just get rid of open market operations. <laughs> just let, let the market, just, just let interest rates go, whatever. No, of course, they, they always uh, tacitly admit that they want the Fed involved in, in the markets to affect interest rates uh, because they know it has an effect at some level. Uh, and so that's where we are. However, the Fed can progressively lose more and more control of interest rate markets. And I think we're seeing some of that now in how, in spite of the Fed's efforts, these, the 10-year, the 30-year, the uh, they're, they're slowly continuing to march upward, which is very different from what we saw the last 35 years, as it was all just this bull market in bonds and and yields were just going down, down, down as prices increased in bonds. But if that situation persists, right, Jonathan, the, these zombie companies, these companies that were relying heavily on refinancing, that these smaller companies that need to be able to get loans to stay afloat, it's gonna go right back to what you were talking about, right? The, uh, they're not gonna be able to survive, whereas larger banks, larger entities that can rely on bailouts and such, they'll be okay. So this will just be another step in the destruction of competition and destruction of the entrepreneurial economy. Uh, or am I reading that wrong? No, no, that's right. So um, uh, there are many, I mean, not just firms, but whole industries, whole sectors that are very dependent on, uh, on consistently 
low interest rates or decreasing interest rates uh, for the for the very reason that you just described that they're uh, if they get into any sort of trouble uh, they can refinance uh, they can you know borrow more money more cheaply if interest rates are decreasing uh, one uh, little bit of nuance that I can add to the discussion about uh, the Fed's control over interest rates. I think the right way to think about it is uh, the Fed is a leader when they're pushing interest rates down, but they're a follower when interest rates are coming back up. So, um, <clears throat> like you said, the Fed has – they have a lot of control over interest rates, and they can lose control. The times where they lose control, it's when, uh, you know, to use a uh, Rothbardian lang uh, language, it's when the market is reasserting itself. It's, it's, uh, and what that usually looks like from our perspective – is that inflation has become politically unpopular. So like the, everybody's asking or, or blaming the Fed, blaming the government for inflation and in the way that the, the Fed is you know, somewhat, uh, fo not forced, but the, the way that they respond to that is they uh, allow interest rates to rise. But the key word allow, right? So they just let the market go back up to uh, where, uh, closer to where interest rates uh, would have been or would be. Um, if they didn't have that manipulation from the central bank. But obviously, like especially during a crisis, you see short-term interest rates you know, plunge. They go way, way down. And that's obviously the work of the, the Fed. That's the central bank that's you know, pushing interest rates down to the floor, uh, like we saw uh, for many years, uh, close to zero. Like That's not something that would ever happen on the market. And so that's clearly central bank uh, manipulation that's, that's doing that. Well, and I think this brings us back to the issue then of – Right. There are large things going on in the economy that are not just that can, can't be cured with positive attitudes and Trump saying nice things about how America is the greatest country ever and all that stuff. This does not. Not, not with that attitude, Ryan. <laughs> all the bad attitude is on. It seems to be coming from your end. <laughs> if, you, if you truly love America, you will never say anything <laughs> negative about its economy. Uh, be, be, and that demonstrates just how truly ignorant people are. Right. They think that that economies are determined, that business cycles are determined by how you feel about the economy, right? That it's all about just expectations. If you, if you expect the economy to improve, the economy will improve. If you expect the economy to do poorly, the economy will do poorly, as if it has nothing to do with capital investment, has nothing to do with spending, has nothing to do with debt, none of these things, has nothing to do with uh, monetary inflation. Uh, but the reality is, is that these things exist in the real world, and, and the real determinants of business cycles are not how you feel about them. Uh, and so these, this is what's going on in the economy, and, and Trump is going to have to face this. And what we've seen, of course, is he, of course, has none of the tools, right? He doesn't understand how things work, and his response is to use government threats and government power to assert uh, some sort of... I, I don't know, uh, control over the economy. I, what I'm speaking of is uh, this is reflected in Trump's plan to uh, get rid of the BRICS efforts to create a new uh, currency. And he basically said, hey, you BRICS countries that are, are plotting to create a new cur currency to compete with the dollar, I'm going to slap 100% tariff on all of you countries if you persist with your attempts to circumvent the dollar. Now, uh, first of all, I'll note that, no, I don't think that the, the BRICS countries are about to create any sort of currency that will uh, directly compete with the dollar. These, the, these countries are mostly basket cases, um, and I think BRICS is mostly a geopolitical alliance, uh, an attempt to uh, just draw away and reduce, to some extent, U.S. Uh, hegemonic control in the world. Okay, fine. And a part of that, I think, is just to create some, some sort of alternative to the dollar, uh, which is unlikely to actually compete with the dollar. But I think it's kind of funny that Trump is basically saying, yep, we, we can't expect people to voluntarily use the dollar, uh, so we'll just start threatening people with ruinous tariffs uh, because they talk about not using the dollar. I mean, <laughs> what an admission that is. Uh, I don't think the dollar is as weak as 
Um, Trump maybe fears it is, and it could all just be posturing. I don't know. But the idea that the United States is going around threatening people for not using the dollar just shows how absurd the situation has become uh, in terms of uh, U.S. attempts to impose uh, global control on people by forcing them to use the dollar. This has been going on, of course, for years, especially with the Russia sanctions and things like that. But the whole thing should be regarded as absurd. What you should be trying to do is strengthen the dollar, not threatening other people who don't want to use the dollar. Um, but that would require reigning in deficit spending and such, and obviously this administration has no interest in that. Yeah, uh, what you just said is, uh, uh, r right before you mentioned deficit spending, is exactly what I was going to respond. So, like, if, if you uh, try to use force, if you try to use uh, tariffs, uh, any sort of barrier to trade, economic sanctions, uh, and your goal is to uh, increase the use of the dollar in international trade, uh, then you're actually going to get the opposite result. You're, you're actually going to drive people further away from the dollar. So, like, if you want more people to use the dollar, then you don't, you don't uh, threaten something that would decrease international trade using dollars, right? Uh, and, and, like, the, like the biggest headlines that people around the world were looking at when they were th – um, when they're contemplating the future of the dollar is like, well, look, the U.S. seems comfortable to – uh, basically use the dollar as a weapon. So, so like, we'll, we'll remove your ability to use uh, dollars and dollar-denominated assets. In, in fact, we'll even confiscate from them if we don't like you. Uh, and so that, that has actually caused people to, be, because of that threat, because I, I, if I think that the U.S. might do that against me and my country, then, you know, maybe I'll start using or looking at different currencies besides the dollar. Uh, and so, I mean, it's just a, it's a great example of... Um, I guess we'd call it unintended consequence. Uh, but like you said, it could it could just be posturing. Uh, uh, a lot of people have been talking about tariffs lately, and it's it's sort of it's hard for me to uh, uh, comment on it because a lot of the proposals for tariffs and the rationale behind them, uh, while some of it is economic, a lot of it is not economic. And really, like what e economics can say about tariffs is very different than what you know, like political science can say about tariffs or. Um, uh, in other arenas. Uh, so, like, if you're using the threat of a tariff to try to get a country to, to do a certain thing, enact a certain policy, or remove a certain policy, that's totally different than the economic analysis of tariffs. And you're talking about specialization between countries, comparative advantage, and all that sort of thing. Um, and so it could be, like, a similar situation here where, may, you're right, maybe it is just posturing. Maybe Trump is just trying to, you know, uh, force their hand. Um, but it could be a bluff. Who knows? Well, I, and I'm going to kind of push back a little bit on that because I, I think that one of, the, one of the dynamics of this I think needs to, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? Because what essentially that sort of Trump threat about the BRICS, it, BRICS is, right, is he is calling essentially for normalization of trade relations with countries that, that have, there's been foreign policy escalation, right? And yet the projection of Trump, and, and he leaned into it heavily on the trail, right? He's like, oh, there's no better word in the English language than tariffs, right? <laughs> well, like if, if you actually believe that, right, if that is your economic policy, then, then you, you would subscribe that to protectionism. But if you are a protectionist, then why, is, you know, th then why are you projecting a desire essentially for more trade with BRICS countries? And I think this is where kind of that, that tariff as a negotiation point, I mean, we saw this with, I think, the, the, you know, him, him tweeting about Canada and, and, and Mexico and right, wanting to get Mexicans, uh, Mexico's cooperation with immigration policy, or if not, we're going to raise your tariffs, right? You know, so there's definitely a big aspect of it. We saw this play out in a big time. Um, with the Trump uh, first administration, right, was tariffs essentially as a negotiation ploy, an escalation uh, for, for negotiation sort of t uh, tactics that we saw in a, a number of, of aspects there. Um, but I, I think that's an, that's, it's, it's, it's an interesting, you know, it, it, it's, there's, a, there's an interesting tension between a desire to normalize trade relations with the BRICS you know, as, as a way of getting them to abandon dollar rivalries there and with this notion of Trump as trying to, to establish a protectionist regime. And, and I, I think if you actually look at, um, you know, to the extent that uh, personnel's policy, it is worth mentioning as well, is that one of the biggest uh, proponents for um, you know, protectionist style policies in Trump's campaign orbit was uh, Robert Lighthizer, uh, who was part of the Trump campaign the first time around. He's kind of one of the true believers on the tariffs, uh, on the tariff side of things, pushing back against uh, you know, his you know, minutiae and kind of the more status quo sort of uh, folks that he had. Uh, 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 Goldman Sachs guy was you know, chairman of National Economic Council and things like that, right? Um, he is not in the administration. Like, he wanted commerce. He wanted treasury. He got neither of those p positions. Instead, you, you, you do have uh, 
uh, uh, uh, you know, the, I can't, can't remember his name, his name off the top of his head, but you have the transition guy that is at Commerce who's a little more um, uh, aggressive and has, has talked a little bit about the tariff issue more. But some of like the, the true trade hawks um, are not in this administration as it stands right now. You have a little bit more of a status quo, or I don't want to say status quo necessarily, but kind of conventional wisdom um, sort of crowd there. I mean, these are not people that, you know, uh, his, his chair of economic, National Economic Council was, you know, a Bush guy, which you can, you know, kind of, you know, you can snark at that a little bit. Um, but I, I think it's, it's that, that aspect of international trade normalization as a goal um, in trying to extract certain aspects of policy, whether it's you know, for, foreign policy angles, right? Is, is, it, is it a carrot essentially for, for uh, negotiations with Russia and Ukraine and things like that? I, I, th I think that has to be acknowledged as an aspect of that equation because again, there's an inherent tension between a protectionist Trump and a, you know, I'm gonna threaten your trade Trump as a, as a negotiations tool when it comes to the BRICS. And when it comes to the spending side of it though, like it, it's, it's to me like if, if we're gonna measure the long term, you know, the success of Trump in four years, uh, it's going to come down to the measure that we started the show with, right? Is, is it easier to buy a house in 2008 than it was in 2024? And the Fed can't do that. It's all going to come down to the spending side of things. And so basically the entire success is, is there genuine, you know, is, is there an actual concerted effort with political buy-in to cut spending? Is, is Doge, is Elon Musk, is Vivek Ramaswamy, is, is you know, Russ Vaughn, the, the OBM guy, are, are, are they successful at cutting spending. That's the entire equation. Is the U.S. capable of cutting spending? And I, I feel like if we can't do it right now, with this political, if we can't do, if we can't cut spending in the next four years, our political system is incapable, fundamentally, systemically incapable of cutting spending. And that's where everything comes down to is, is there, is there any ability using every single tool, you know, these, these new billionaires that are in the Trump orbit, all this sort of stuff, is that the ability, is there the ability to cut spending in the next four years? And if we can't, then we're on the road to ruin. Um, but like that's where everything comes down to. That's where all these, yeah, you know, everything comes down to that single question. And it's been very interesting to see how that uh, that project plays out. Yeah, all the all the talk about bricks and everything, it all just strikes. So much of what's coming out, like all this obsession about how we're going to fire federal workers and all this stuff. There's more government. There's more federal contractors than there are federal employees. That's just kind of dancing around the issue. Yeah. This all this stuff about oh, we can't. They're already setting us up for failure. They're already preparing us for failure by talking about how it's going to be so hard to fire federal employees. They could get rid of more federal workers by just firing all the contractors and you would be left with a, a small shell and none of those people are protected by civil service. So the, the whole, so that's just one way to distract away from the real issue, which is cutting spending. And the whole BRICS thing strikes me. It's just a distraction from the easy laissez faire way to get more people to use the dollar. How do you get more people to use the dollar? Stop inflating the money supply. Stop, <laughs> uh, stop deficit spending. Well, you don't have to even abolish the Fed or anything, right? And I think you've talked about this before, Jonathan. It's right. Just stop the Fed's ability to buy assets. Just have the Fed stop buying up trillions in mortgage-backed securities, in uh, government treasuries. And you better believe that the next time there's any sort of financial crisis or recession, the Fed's going to be right back to that. It's going to be doing it all over again. And, and then you're going to have to start to see real doubts about the dollar again. So, yeah, I don't know. My attitude is spare me all of the, um, all of the gestures about international relations and stuff. Just stop doing things. It's, <laughs> stop printing money. Stop have, engaging in runaway spending. This isn't uh, rocket science. And... Also, all of this, uh, all of this other stuff, talking about what other countries are doing, everything that expends capital, political capital as well, right? There's only so many hours in the day. You can talk about cutting spending, or you can talk about making Brazil do what you want. Um, they have chosen to, to, to threaten Brazil and talk about making Brazil use the dollar, et cetera, et cetera, is how it's being framed. Uh, that's fine, but they're they're just trying to distract from the real issue of cutting spending and i completely agree of course though that if they can't cut spending now it ain't gonna ever happen uh and i don't think it's gonna happen i i think the united states is locked into a downward spiral just like the soviet union was in the 80s with all those attempts at reform it all led to the same place uh, the ultimate disillusion uh political disillusion um and uh, and economic chaos and ultimately hyperinflation, which is what occurred at the end days of 
the Soviet Union. So uh, <laughs> that's what uh, America is just going to split up into smaller pieces. It's going to go through a period of, of uh, extreme economic trial because I just don't see how they're going to be cutting a trillion dollars. There's nothing about the Trump administration that would lead us to believe any willingness uh, to do any of this. It was under the Trump administration that we started to see trillion dollar peacetime uh, deficits during an economic expansion. They were running like 900 billion deficits. While we were told everything was great, the Fed told us the, in 2018, 2019, the economy's great, it's peacetime, you know, theoretically. And uh, there's no reason to run deficits that size, and yet they did. And then, of course, for 2020, everything went through the roof uh, in the Trump administration, right? He wanted to ram through massive new spending bills during COVID. That's when he tried to um, get Thomas Massey thrown out of the House of Representatives because Thomas Massey dared give a damn about the U.S. Constitution. And Trump said, screw that. No, we have no time for the Constitution. We have to spend a trillion dollars. And I mean, that's the real dynamic of this administration. And yeah, I'm, I'm predicting no meaningful cuts <laughs> to, uh, to spending, and it's just going to continue uh, going where it's going. I, I see the Trump administration as kind of the, the early... Uh, the early birth pangs, the uh, these are these are the um, the early contractions in the <laughs> in a process that brings about a new political system. But we're so far from any sort of real meaningful reform because no one's willing to do what it takes to actually change anything. So uh, that's it's going to be lots of talk about w the administration is going to come up with a dozen different ways to uh, preserve the U.S. economic system and the dollar without actually doing the thing that would preserve the dollar and the American economic system, which is reducing the role of the U.S. federal government in the economy. They just have no interest in doing that uh, outside of some deregulation, which would be great and will help, but it's, uh, it's just nothing compared to the, to the monetary and um, the spending issue, which is so far out of control, so wild, so insane by historical standards that uh, that's where the real pro problem lies. And I just don't see any willingness to do anything about that. Well, uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. If that doesn't put you in a, in a cheery you know, Christmas spirit, then I don't know what will. But yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Is uh, there's it looks like there's some political will to decrease regulations, um, like you see Elon and uh, Vivek on Twitter, and they're you know they're you know chomping at the bit to you know, take apart some agencies, uh, take apart some uh, some regulations. But uh, one thing that we haven't uh, mentioned in this episode is that a huge chunk of government spending is stuff that's would be untouchable by the Doge, which is like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Um, I, I, I mean, they might be able to. Um, do something with defense spending, but even that is a stretch. I, I don't think that uh, there, there's there's not enough political will to touch the defense side of things. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's. I mean, to use a to use an overused analogy, uh, a lot of it might just be rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Well, and, and going to the, the question of political will, th th this is I think the, the larger issue is that it really doesn't matter what the administration is. Right. Like, I mean, if you if 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 you were to look back, right, and you look at at pre pre COVID 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 being what it is, you know, if you look at the, the budgets that the Trump administration put out regularly, there were there were spending cuts. They weren't significant, but there were spending cuts. The problem is, is the budget process is controlled by the legislature and the legislature has no interest in getting rid of, you know, studies studying the cocaine habits of quails and their sex drive. Right. <laughs> because somebody, some congressional district benefits from that money. And, and, and so that's what's going to be interesting is what is the stick that is that is, so, so let, let's let's say let, let's say that that Elon and Vivek, let's say that there's a genuine desire within the Trump administration itself, within the White House to do spending cuts. Then the question is, what is the you know, what tools do they have to browbeat Congress, to browbeat the legislature into following through? And I don't and, and that's that to me, like that's going to be the interesting question. And that's where Elon on the board is is the most interesting player here, because it is is politics is as new refound is, 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 is his interest in all of this. Is this a hobby or is this something he's actually going to dedicate the next couple of years to? Because this guy's six, seven times wealthier than George Soros. 
And we've seen the ability of George Soros to shake up things, little niches that he wants within the political process. Is he going to go out there and threaten every single Republican congressman that doesn't go along with spending cuts? Um, is there anything procedurally, right? Like the, the one area where you actually see uh, uh, government programs shut down is when they do what BRACs sort of, even they close down military bases. And you have to have buy it up front because you know whenever, whenever you actually know what bases are going to be shut down, there's going to be a move to protect it, right? So you have to get buy it up front to let the process play out. Uh, and, and that's again, this is where it's, it's kind of small, potato y, sort of like C SPAN level politics, right? But like, and, and there, there was an opportunity, very small, um, when like the, the Republican House caucus was like creating their rules, right? Like if you vote against, like they could have put in like, if you vote against those recommendations and you lose all your, your, you lose all your perks, right? You can't go to the gym or something like that, right? There's, there's, there's little elements in terms of the procedure up front to force Congress to go along with any proposals that come out from this force. And so far they haven't done that yet. Now, are they? Well, we'll see. But like, that's where everything's gonna come down to is can they browbeat Congress into following through on cuts, presuming that the administration is serious about those cuts. And those, those are two variables there. I think the first variable is, is, is even a bigger question mark than the second one. Uh, but like that, that's the problem though, is that it doesn't matter who you elect as president when the entire system of government is built upon bringing bacon back home to your district so you don't lose, uh, so, so you don't lose elections, or even worse, lose the respect of your local chamber of commerce and whatever you know, your specific donors that are unique to you. And that is the problem, is that we are systemically, structurally built to have the government budget go up and up and up until something radical changes there, everything else is rhetoric. Well, um, on that, th there is one thing that the president can do. I, I recently, or possibly, um, I was uh, listening to uh, Rand Paul on, um, he was on Larry Kudlow's show, and he had this uh, interesting idea for Trump to actually renew, pr propose to renew all these regulations and programs, and that would actually force a vote on those things in Congress. So, uh, so a lot of these uh, programs and, and regulations are built with, like, specific you know time horizons where they have to exist, and like you can't you can't uh, vote on it until you actually. Um, like get to the end of one of those time horizons, but the way that uh, Trump could actually force Congress's hand to actually do some voting on all these things is to, is counterintuitively to renew them today. Like, like basically say, okay, yes, we are going to do this, uh, this, this program. Now, I, I don't know all the, the politics of it, um, but if, if he goes in and he renews all of these regulations and programs and agencies, then that would actually force Congress to go in and do an up or down vote on all these things, which, I mean, that would be a, a circus I would love to watch. Well, yeah, God forbid Congress be involved in anything that actually affects your daily life. I mean, that's basically the federal government's on autopilot, right, is they passed all of these new laws creating regulatory bodies, and then it just becomes the domain of the administrative state, which determines what all the regulations are. They have their own internal judge, their own internal legal system that... Uh, determines all of that. And some progress has been made on that, like with the Chevron decision uh, being overturned and that sort of thing. Uh, and we do have yet to see that play out. I think maybe there's some, maybe some good stuff from the administration on that in terms of the regulatory state. And again, that will help. That will be a move in the right direction, but it's not gonna fix the business cycle issue. It's not gonna fix the monetary inflation. It's not really going to make, it's gonna make life marginally more affordable, but it's not really gonna solve any fundamental problems. I mean, one thing will be interesting too, and this will be something we can monitor, monitor for the next month, is what does the Biden administration do to proactively harden some of these aspects of the administrative state of uh, civil service rules and things like that. I, mean, I already saw that, I, I think it's the Social Security Administration Union was able to extend uh, their remote work package going through 2000, uh, 2029, funny how that day comes up. Um, you know, there was a, a project, I, I, was, I think it was kind of uh, 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 James O'Keefe's group, right, you know, was, of like, EPA people talking about how they're just, they're just pushing grant money out into, the, into their kind of special NGO classes to just, you know, they're basically just looting in the treasury mode right now, just, just taking the gold outside of uh, 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 the, these, the, the actual administration itself because you don't want Trump people putting it in, putting it in the hands of allies right now before getting it gets done. I think the next month is going to be very interesting because, you know, for, for all of our cynicism, I think that there are people in D.C. 
who have gotten rich and fat off these things that do have, at the very least, they recognize the next four years it, it, it expands the, the level of possibilities than, than perhaps in the past. And so I think they are taking these threats very seriously. And so they're kind of proactive attempts to counteract or to protect against any attempts at serious reform are themselves going to be very interesting and telling in its own right. Um, that's without even getting into the pardon issue and like how many, uh, how many deep state crooks are going to end up getting pardons before Biden leaves office. But I think that, that's going to be, I think, a very interesting story for the next six weeks or so until we get to the Trump, uh, Trump inauguration. Um, because again, how much, what, what is the deep state's reaction to the possibility of change going forward is going to be very, very telling on how they view things going forward. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up with that then for this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Jonathan, for joining us today. And we'll be back next week with more. We'll see you next time.